Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, the object I'm going to discuss would, cert would certainly have been included in the SOAS exhibition if its relevance to Zoroastrian heritage had not been fully recognized only a few months ago, too late to obtain it as a loan. The silver plate has been kept since before 1858 in the Cabinet des Médailles of the National Library in Paris. It was acquired from Prince Soltikov and was probably found in the southern Ural, like most Sasanian and Peri-Sasanian plates acquired in this period by museums, especially the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. This plate has been traditionally known as the Anaitis plate, according to the old and incorrect assumption that most nude or half-nude female figures on Sas Sasanian dishes depict or symbolize Anahita, goddess of the waters. In fact, the central motif shows a lady in transparent dress wearing a pearl necklace and seated on a griffin which combines animal elements from both the earth and the air. To the earth belong the lion's body and the goat horns. To the air belong the beak of a bird of prey and the wing whose base is hardly visible on the right shoulder. The tail ends with a palm leaf and thus refers to the realm of plants. The upper and lower axis of the dish are marked by an identical figure combining a moon crescent and the bare head of a young man. Four dancing couples are evenly distributed around the inner surface of the dish. Among the eight characters, six have long plates covered by a veil or ornamented by floating ribbons. They are certainly women. This is probably also the case of the two other characters who have short, bear, short uncovered hair, but are also dressed as women. I shall now describe these eight figures. For reasons which will be justified subsequently, I proceed anti-clockwise and take as a starting point the couple to the left. The character on the left of this couple holds a lotus flower in one hand, and in the other one, a bird, apparently a falcon. The woman who faces him holds an incense burner. Of all characters, she's the only one who is clearly not dancing, for her feet are covered with folds at the bottom of her dress. In the space to her right, there is a cup. In the second couple, both women have transparent upper clothes showing their breasts. The one to the left <clears throat> makes a salutation or an auspicious gesture with her palm, while the, rhine, the one on her right presents a bowl whose contents are indicated by a series of small punched circles. The astral symbol is set between them at head level. In the third couple, the character on the left with short curly hair holds a staff or a spear in his right hand and a torch in his left hand. The wavy lines of the flames are visible. The woman facing him presents a cup held in her right hand while the left hand holds the base of a goat skin which rests on her shoulder. The fourth couple at the top of the composition comprises two women. The one on the left makes a salutation or a respectful gesture with her pointed finger and the other one holds a bucket. The astral symbol reappears between them. The first elaborate comments on this plate were presented by Prudence Harper in 1971. She identified the Greco-Roman models of the composition. The woman seated on the griffin recalls Ceres on a griffin or Dionysus on a panther. In the latter case, one can compare, among other examples, the badminton sarcophagus, where Dionysus and his panther is surrounded by characters symbolizing the seasons. On some other images, for example, this late Roman mosaic from Ravenna, the seasons are dancing. This is how Prudence Harper proposed to interpret the dancer on her plate, though not going into any detail. In 1986, Boris Marshak 
offered a more detailed study in a section of his masterly book, Zilbershetsu des Orients. Firstly, he pointed to some North Indian influences in the costumes with their long shawls recalling saris, as well as in the thick plates of the ladies and in the various dance steps. Moreover, he identified one character as symbolizing the festival of the Khorshid Odarj Jashn, which, according to Biruni, was particularly popular in Tokharistan, the ancient country of Bactria in northern Afghanistan. Consequently, he attributed the plate not to Sasanian Iran, but to Tokharistan, which was exposed to Indian influences in all periods, including the Sasanian one. As for the central figure, he compared a plate found at Tomis in the Ural, and now in the Hermitage. Here, the decoration consists of fish and plants, symbolizing various tears of the earth, while the lady plays the flute and rides a Pacific griffin, which, like the one on our plate, is a combination of a lion, a goat, a bird, and has a plant tail. According to Marshak, this figure should be interpreted as an allegory of the earth, rather than as a particular goddess. It can be noted, however, that on the wooden panels from Kuiruk Tobe, near Otra on the Sirdaria, a goddess seated on a griffin throne holds an ossuary and should therefore be identified as Spandarmat, the goddess protectress of the earth, who, according to Middle Persian texts, at the time of the last judgment, hands over to Hormaz the bones which have been entrusted to her. Marshak's main contribution to the explanation of this plate was his recognition of the dancing couples not merely as general symbols for the seasons, but as personifications of Zoroastrian festivals carrying specific attributes at associated with them. I shall soon present the details of his interpretation, but beforehand, it is necessary to sum up briefly our present knowledge of the Zoroastrian calendar in the East during the period 6th, 7th century, to which Harper and Marshak have attributed the plate and stylistic criteria. This knowledge has recently progressed, thanks to the study by François de Blois and Nicolas Sims-Williams of dating formulas, formulas and Bactrian documents from the Kingdom of Robe in Bactria. Here, as everywhere in the Iranian world, because of the missing quarter of a day in the calendar year, the months had advanced by eight or nine positions from the original, original seasonal point they had occupied at the time of the creation of the calendar in the Achaemenid period. This implies, for example, that no ruse, this is the original situation, and uh, no ruse, uh, having moved forward by three quarters of a year, now fell in June and July instead of March. This is a situation in the sixth, seventh century. We also know that contrary to Sogdiana and Khorasmia, Tokharistan had officially adopted the calendar reform instituted in about 470 under the Sasanian king Peroz. This reform did not change the succession of the month, but pushed back Nowruz and the main festivals by eight months, thus re-establishing their initial position in the solar year. Nowruz is, ah, no seems to be missing here. Uh, ah, yes, it's, uh, it was on top. Uh, Nowruz actually is reinstituted in his former position, but uh, in, another, in a different month. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the reform failed in two respects. Firstly, as no other correction was attempted until the 11th century, the calendar year started at once to move ahead of the solar year. Secondly, people tended to keep to their former habits, and the new dates of festivals were not generally accepted. Some of them remained in the place they had occupied before the reform. Others were du duplicated at an eight-month distance, various solutions being adopted in the different regions. This chaotic situation is still reflected in the most detailed account we have of Zoroastrian festivals in the post-Sassanian period, that of Al-Biruni in his chronology, composed in various stages during the first half of the 11th century. 
It follows that when we try to link the depiction of a festival with a particular time of the year, we have to take into account four possibilities. Pre-reform date, post-reform date, duplication, or a purely seasonal festival independent from the structure of the calendar. Let us now return to Marshak's interpretation. He considered that this figurative calendar had to be read anticlockwise, with which I agree, and he took as a starting point the couple at the bottom, which he assumed to represent no ruse, then in early summer, hence their light clothes. According to him, the astral symbol associated with this couple is not linked to the solstice nor to the equinox, but simply symbolizes no ruse. In the same way, the identical symbol in the opposite position would indicate the festival of Miragon, which took place six and a half months later, and here would be symbolized by the bucket containing water mixed with haoma. Between Nowruz in summer and Mihragon in winter, there is the late autumn festival of Horshid Odar Jashn, which, according to Biruni, was the main fire festival in Toharistan. It is here indicated by the character holding a torch. Following Mihragon, the last couple is associated with two spring festivals. One is the Jashn in Ilufar, a festival mentioned by Biruni and attached not to a fixed calendar date, but to the seasonal blossoming of the water lilies in June. Still according to Marshak, the other spring festival would be Sade, the other Great Fire Festival, occurring 50 days and 50 nights before Nowruz, hence its name meaning the Andrets. According to medieval descriptions, Sade was celebrated with, celebrated with bonfires, where birds and various animals covered with pitch were released. Marshak recognized an allusion to this practice in attributes distributed between both characters of the couple. To the left, a bird, and to the right, the incense burner, which he interpreted as a fire holder instead. At this point, the calendar circle is complete. While admitting that Marshak's contribution has definitely put the interpretation of these images on the right path, and accepting several of his identifications, I have to express some points of disagreement. At first glance, it seems strange that no ruse occupies the bottom position, with the dancers being seen upside down. Also, some of his interpretations of specific attributes are far from being straightforward. There is no particular reason to associate a bucket of water either with Mihragon or with the Haoma ritual, for in this ritual, the mixing of Haoma and the water takes place in the pestle where the Haoma twigs have been crushed. <clears throat> also, the symbols supposedly representing the festival of Sade are, uh, no, excuse me, here, are not convincing. The closed object held by the woman on the right is hardly a fire holder, and the bird opposite is probably a falcon, which does not at all recall medieval descriptions of Sade, nor images. Um, actually, on these images and descriptions, the fire is lit in the open, and the birds released are pigeons and, uh, uh, or peacocks, not falcons. Therefore, I propose to recognize this couple as the true depiction of the New Year festivals, instead of the following couple, as Marshak would have us believe. Indeed, the falcon is mentioned in connection with no ruse in medieval descriptions. In the Mahasin al Nairuz wal Mirjan, now reattributed to the 9th century author Al Kisrawi, it is stated that in Sasanian times, a white oak was let free on each day of the Nowruz cycle. In the Nowruz Nami, conventionally attributed to Omar Khayyam, a hawk is listed among the offerings presented to the kings by the chief of the Meiji on the first day of Nowruz. As in the period to which Ordish belongs, Nowruz fell in June or early July, the water lily flower could actually indicate the Jashni Nilufar, which occurred in June, as proposed by Marshak. As for the lady to the right, there are two reasons for associ associating her with the flower digan, the festival for the dead, which was held in the 10 days preceding Nowruz. Firstly, 
She does not dance, and she is the most modestly dressed of all characters, with her long veil and her feet covered, which looks appropriate if she is linked with a commemoration of the dead. Secondly, what she holds is in fact an incense burner, and according to Biruni, during the Frauer Digon, I quote, they fumigate their houses with juniper so that the dead can enjoy the smell. A difficulty could arise from the fact that Biruni associates the Frauer Digon celebrated in Persia not with the Norus of the kings, the Norus celebrated at the date it occupied before Pero's reform, but with the reformed Norus of the Magi, which occurred eight months later. In the neighbor country of Sogjana, however, Norus was consistently celebrated at its, at its ancient date, and Zoroastrians of Tokharistan might well have followed this uh, custom. An Ordish, this couple is preceded by a cup, which al Kisrawi and the Norus Name mention as being also presented to the king on the day of Norus. It is also an attribute of Yima, considered as the king who established Norus. Pursuing anti-clockwise, we find the couple in summer clothes. The major festival, which then marked the end of summer, was Tiragon, which Biruni describes at, at its pre-reform date, which is, it also occupies here. Biruni mentions that a special dish made of unground wheat and fruits was consumed on this occasion. I propose to recognize it in the bowl presented by the lady on the right. So now, the astral symbol can, can no longer symbolize no rose. It must be associated with the late summer festival. It could well be the autumn equinox which closes the summer in the same way as the symbol at the other end of the dish would be the spring equinox. This is consistent with the fact that the symbols are identical. If they were meant to, this, to depict the solstices, they would be contrasted. Expre they express the equal distribution between the night, figured by the moon crescent, and the day, figured by the young man. For the following couple, I fully agree with Marshak's identification of the Khorshid Adar Jashn, symbolized by the torch. But, contrary to him, I consider it as the only fire festival shown on the dish. Marshak did not commend the attributes of the lady in front, a cup and a goat skin. They clearly allude to wine. They, and not the bucket in the following scene, indicate the autumn festival of Miragon, the only occasion when, according to the testimony of Ctesias, the king appeared drunk in public. We are now left with the last couple, for which the only attribute is a bucket. This is just a water bucket, and it alludes to Orbrezagon, the water spilling festival, which took place on the last day of the 11th month and when people threw water at each other. This festival is mentioned at exactly the same date by Chinese travelers at Samarkand uh, in the early 7th century. And I have proposed elsewhere to recognize it on a wall painting from a temple at Penjikent. Okay. People throwing water. Pe half nude people throwing water to each other. As suggested before, the astral symbol here stands for the spring equinox marking the end of winter. The yearly cycle can now start again with Frauer Digon and Norus. <clears throat> I shall now try to place the distribution of these figures in the calendar as well as in the solar year more precisely. Each couple symbolizes a group of three months, not necessarily corresponding with what we consider the limits of the four seasons. In order to pinpoint the system in the solar year, we have two guiding marks. The seasonal festival of the water lilies, which took place in June, independently from the movements of the calendar, and is here closely associated with Frauer Digan and Norus, and the summer clothes of the figures representing the following period. As Marshak considered that group corresponded to Norus, he put this festival in July, and accordingly, he dated the object of the, to the period when the new year, new year fell in July, that is, the second half of the sixth century. If, in fact, Norus belongs to the previous block of month, as I have tried to show, 
we should consider a slightly later stage in the history of the calendar. Supposing no rules occurred before June, it would lead us to the 8th century, which seems too late from the stylistic point of view. Supposing it occurred after June, it would push the following block of month after the summer, which, um, uh, though the corresponding dancing couple clearly wear summer clothes. Taken all together, no rules in June seems to be the best option, which leads us to a period between the last quarter of the 6th century and the end of the 7th century. Assuming that the equinoxes depicted in the middle of the second and fourth couples of dancers occurred in the middle of the periods they symbolize, I propose the following system. The first group comprises the 12th, 1st, and 2nd months of the Zoroastrian calendar, and at that time corresponds roughly to May, June, July. It includes the Frawar Digan, Nowruz, and the Water Lilies Festival. The second group comprises the 3rd, 4th, and 5th months, and corresponds roughly to August, September, October. It includes the autumn equinox in the middle and Tiragon at about the same time. The third group comprises the 6th, 7th, and 8th months and corresponds roughly to November, December, January. It includes the Odar Jashn, uh, Horshid Odar Jashn at the very beginning and Mihragon in the middle. The fourth group comprises the 9th, 10th, and 11th months and corresponds roughly to February, March, April. It includes the spring equinox in the middle and Abrezagon at the very end. If the equinoxes actually occurred in the middle of the fourth and tenth Zoroastrian months respectively, then the period when the dish was produced can be narrowed down to the second half of the second century. This is precisely the date which Prudence Harper had proposed 40 years ago. To conclude, this document provides fundamental evidence for the existence and status of Zoroastrianism in Tokharistan in the period between the fall of the Sasanian Empire and the completion of the Arab conquest of the region. I do not intend to deny the importance of Buddhism in Tokharistan at this time, nor the protection it continued to enjoy from many rulers. But I would like to suggest that its importance has been overestimated due to the overwhelming proportion of texts, monuments, and images issued from this religion. Zoroastrianism being still largely taught orally and producing less images, moreover, often indistinguishable from the Hindu models in the East, has left less tangible traces. On the dish discussed in this paper, the choice of some symbols seems to point to a court milieu. The falcon and cup presented to the king at Nowruz, or the allusion to wine drinking at Miragorn. The very high quality of execution, though quite different from dishes previously executed in the Sasanian royal style, also speaks in favor of this assumption. At the same time, we can realize more and more how Biruni is a safe guide to recognize festivals and their symbols in their regional diversity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Francois. Thank you. I'd like to um, thank uh, Sarah Stewart and the other organizers, um, uh, Alan Williams and Alvo Tinsa, for inviting me to give a paper at this conference. And I would also like to add that I am both an outsider and an insider. <laughs> so please have mercy with me. <laughs> I am an outsider because I'm not Zoroastrian, but I am an insider because I'm Iranian. So, uh, this set of modern glazed tiles that you see on the screen uh, come from Parsi, Mumbai, and they are now in the British Museum. They depict a series of iconographic features that originally date to ancient Persia, but have become symbols of modern Zoroastrianism. 
And here I'm very grateful to uh, Firuza Mystery from guiding me uh, through the computer, through the various images, and also Malcolm Debu. Thank you. These are the image of the prophet Zarathustra, the winged figure, the Fravashi or Farvaha, the legendary king Lohras, the holy fire and Atishtan, and also architectural details such as human-headed gateway figures and column capital, capitals with bull protomies. Not all these symbols had Zoroastrian connections in the first place. For example, the human-headed gateway figures were inspired by the Lamassu of Assyrian art, but others such as the holy fire and the winged symbol are associated with Zoroastrianism. Let us now look at each of these symbols and tiles and consider their origin and religious signific uh, significance. The image of Zarathustra, which uh, Professor Russell will also talk about, derives from the 4th century AD relief of the Sasanian king Shapur II at Taghabustan near Kermanshah. On the left stands the Zoroastrian divine being, or Yazata Mithra, with his radiate crown. This image inspired the in the 19th century representations of the prophet. The winged symbol is often shown in ancient Persian art of 500 to 280 BC. Here it symbolizes either Ahura Mazda, the wise lord, or the kingly glory, the Khvarna, or Farizadi. On all Achaemenid reliefs, the winged figure appears prominently in the presence of the king of kings, as seen, for example, on the Bisutun relief of Darius the Great of circa 520 BC at the top. It has also, as I said, become a symbolic icon of Zoroastrians, but I would like to add also of non-Zoroastrian Iranians of all denominations, particularly the young gener generation after the revolution of 1979. Then we have the image of King Lohras of the Avestan tradition and Ferdowsi Shahnameh, who was the father of King Vishtaspa, Kavi Vishtaspa, the patron of Zarathustra. And on the Parsi tile that you see, Lohras wears a white priestly outfit but holds a bow like an ancient Persian king in his hand. He resembles Darius the Great and other ancient Persian kings who are always shown in profile, holding a bow, a symbol of kingship, in their hand. At Nakhcherostam, above his tomb, Darius is worshipping in front of a fire altar with a winged figure facing him. And you can see in the middle uh, the drawing by Sir Robert Kerr Porter at the beginning of the uh, 19th century. The holy fire and fire holder derive from a mixture of Achaemenid and Sasanian iconography, as seen on stone reliefs, seals, and also coins. But uh, this modern image of the fire holder seems to be uh, more like uh, Achaemenid uh, uh, artist dance. The architectural setting is a mixture of the Achaemenid gate of all nations, uh, as seen at Persepolis with the bull man on either side, and also the Sasanian arch of Khosrow II at Taghabustan. Another popular modern Zoroastrian image with no original Zoroastrian iconographic connotation is an audience scene with the legendary King Jamshid described here in the, on the tile as Jamshid a Jam, but of course Jamshid has a very special position in the uh, Avesta and also in the Shahnameh, the king par excellence, uh, the king who introduces Nowruz. And he appears on this Ghajar tile very much looking like an ancient Persian king as seen uh, below on a uh, fourth century, uh, fifth century relief at Persepolis in an audience scene. Now we shall turn our attention to the Zoroastrian iconography in the Sasanian and Parthian period. The Sasanian kings who came to power in 224, AD 224, were Zoroastrians. And as described by Professor Abdu Yong in an article 
on regional variations in Zoroastrianism in case of the Parthians. From the beginning of the Sasanian Empire, the Zoroastrian religion was part of a new imperial project. Sasanian imperial art, and I would like to emphasize this, please, please make a distinction between art and also the religion. I mean, there are many, many illustrations in the art of the Sasanian, Achaemenid Sasanian, uh, Parthian Sasanian period, which may not be seen as religiously correct, but I believe that the Parthians and the Sasanians, who were neighbors of the Romans, were much influenced by imperial iconography and the messages that were given on their rock reliefs coins, which were circulated not amongst the ordinary people, but amongst the aristocracy and also rulers in outside their empire, had to be strong and had to show them, present them as the holder of the khvarna, the far. The royal art of the Sasanian rulers of Iran uh, show the king as the holder of the khvarna. He is the legitimate ruler, the rightful reader, uh, ruler. He is the possessor of the far. Mithra, various Yazatas like Mithra, Verathragna, who is, who is the same as Bahram, Anahita, and even the royal falcon, the Viragna, have a duty to protect the rightful king and his glory, the Khvarna. A variety of symbols, such as the radiant crown of Mithra, the wild boar of the victorious warrior god, Verathragna, the wings symbolizing Farna, and all these symbol, uh, they emphasize the status of the Sasanian king of kings as chosen by Ahura Mazda and the Yazatas. The king is described as a Mazda worshiper in monumental inscriptions, in texts, and on coin legends. The back of Sasanian coins, as you see, depicts from the very first Sasanian king, Ardashir, the first who came to the throne in 224, a Zoroastrian fire altar. And in fact, at the time of Ardashir, it's not just the fire altar, but it's the fire altar and the throne. So the message is very clear that kingship and, Zora uh, and religion are one and united. It is during the reign of Bahram I and Bahram II in the 270s that we encounter the figure of the high priest Kerdir. In his inscription at Nakhcherostam, he writes, Hormoz, meaning Hormoz II, king of kings, gave me cap and belt and named me Kerdir the Mobed of Ormazd. And from province to province, place to place, the rights of the gods were much increased and many Varahran fires were established. And after Bahram, king of kings, son of Shapur, went to the place of gods, and Bahram, king of kings, son of Bahram, meaning Bahram II, made me Mobad and judge of the whole empire, he made me the director and authority, Padir Shah, over the fire of Anahid Ardashir and Anahid the lady in Stach. And he named me Kerdir, soul saver of Bahram, Mobed of Ormazd. And from province to province, place to place throughout the empire, the rights of, the, of Ormazd and the gods, Yazatan, became more important, and the Mazdayasnian religion and Magians were greatly honored in the empire. And great blows befell Ahriman and the demons. Now, we may say that actually Kerdir goes over the top and exaggerates, and not everything that this is described here was really done by him. But nevertheless, I think he gives a very clear indication of the line and how the state religion was implemented. <coughs> Until the very end, uh, of the Sasanian period, royal Sasanian art and iconography were inseparable, and the Avestan concept of the Khvarna or Far was crucial for the legitimacy of the king. 
to present to himself as the rightful, rightful ruler of Iran Shah. Just as the Sasanians, who were Zoroastrians, and Persians from uh, the area of Persepolis, the earlier local kings of Persis, or Pars, also produced an iconography which is clearly in tune with Zoroastrianism. Coins of Persis of about 280 BC to AD 200 show a variety of worshipping scenes. The king standing in front of a sacred building with or without the winged symbol, or the king holding consecrated rods or the barsom and standing in front of a, the sacred fire in the later periods. Also present are astral symbols as well as the royal falcon with, the, with or without a diadem. And this is very actually important because the falcon, or if we would like to see it as the Varagna bird, is one of the... Um, key elements in the protection of the Khwarna, uh, uh, as described in the Yasht. From about 140 BC, the kings of Persis came under the yoke of the Arsacid Parthians, and you see here at the top two uh, very uh, well-known and important uh, rulers, Mithridates or Mehrdad I and Mehrdad II on the right. And they ruled over a vast empire stretching from the river Euphrates in the east, now in modern Iraq and Syria, to uh, northern, um, northeastern Iran and southeastern Iran and Pakistan. The Arsakids were an Iranian dynasty from the northeast, from Khorasan. So culturally, as also Ag Abdul Yong has um, described in his article, they came from a different background than the Sasanians. Uh, so their religious policy was different. But one also has to bear in mind, which is very important, that under the Parthians, as under also the earlier Achaemenids, there was no such thing as a state religion. State religion does not really set in until under the Sasanians. And under the Achaemenids, we have documents of various gods being worshipped and sacrifices made to them. So, People were allowed to worship whatever they wanted. And although the kings show their allegiance to Ahura Mazda, like Darius does in his inscription, but it does not mean that Zoroastrianism was the only religion. Now, already in the early part of the Parthian or Arsakid period, we have evidence of Zoroastrianism um, being um, a major religion. And we have, for example, the Ostraka from Nisa, the uh, first capital of the Arsakids, now in modern um, Turkmenistan, uh, which, have, um, which give you evidence of the Zoroastrian calendar. We also have, for example, uh, textual evidence from uh, uh, a first century AD classical source, uh, Isidore of Carax, who says that an ever-burning fire was kept at Ashak, which is one of the early Arsakid Parthian um, capitals. And we also read in the Denkard, a 10th century compendium of Zoroastrian beliefs and customs, that King Valach, which you see at the bottom, of Vologazes I, who ruled from AD 51 to 78, instructed all the provinces of his empire to preserve versions of the Avestan books and teachings, both in oral and written form, which had been dispersed as a result of Alexander's pillage and looting between 333, and 300 BC, 333 to 330 BC. Evidence of fire altars can also be found in um, Parthian or Arsakid Parthian art. We see, for example, on a coin of uh, Aravan or Artabanus I, on the back, a figure standing next to a fire altar and holding his hand over it, and the isolated relief of uh, uh, Vologazes III uh, in the second century 
uh, AD shows the king standing again, another king standing in front of a fire altar and sacrificing. In the first century BC, the iconography of Parthian coin becomes very much geared to show that the king received his symbol of kingship from a divine being. And although the iconography is very Hellenistic inspired, which is not a surprise because the Parthians came after the uh, Seleucid and also the Parthians ruled of an area in the western part of their empire which was heavily Macedonian populated as a result of Alexander's um, conquest and the Seleucids. But the contents of the uh, messages, I believe, uh, is very Iranian or can be also understood Zoroastrian because the king is always shown receiving a diadem, a symbol of kingship from a goddess which could be very easily in the guise of a Hellenistic goddess but representing a Zoroastrian or Iranian Yazata. I mean, we know that from the Yash that, as I mentioned before, Anahita, Mithra, Ashi, and Varathragna all protected the Khvarna, the glory. So there is no reason why in the Parthian period they presented divine beings and thought of classical goddesses or gods when they had their own Zoroastrian Iranian uh, uh, divine beings. And to prove that actually there are Zoroastrian divine beings represented on coins, I'm showing you these magnificent gold coins from the collection of the British Museum from ancient Bactria, which is sort of modern, uh, modern northern Afghanistan and Central Asia, of the Kushan period, that is from around AD 110 to 230 AD. The Kushan kings were originally um, Iranians, and uh, they worshipped a whole um, mixture of Zoroastrian and also Hindu gods. Uh, relevant to us are these with Zoroastrian names, and you can see at, on the top left is Olagno. Olagno is the same as Verathragna. Then on the right is Atesho, that is fire, Atash or Atar. Then you have uh, Pharaoh. Then you have Miro, which is Mithra, Mao, which is the moon. And you have Nana, and here I see a clear, um, uh, really link between Nana of Bactria, who was probably inspired from Mesopotamian Nana, but also from Iranian Zoroastrian Anahita. Um, and at the bottom right, Firuze, that's for you, that's Loraspo on horse, on horseback. And there is even a representation inscribed as Ormazd, Ahura Mazda on the far right. So looking to the west of the Parthian Empire, the kingdom of Komagini in southeastern Turkey also produced a distinctive form of religious dualism, which had in evolved by the first century BC with Mithridates I Kalinikos and his son Antiochus I. They claim divinity and descent from a combined Persian and Green ancestry and worshipped a mixture of Iranian and Greek divine beings. At Asamiya on Nymphaios and at Nimrud Da, images of the king in Iranian dress are shown in the presence of Zeus or Mazdas, Apollo, Mithra, Helios, Hermes, and Heracles. Greek inscriptions from Nimrud Da the dynastic shrine of Antiochus refer to his Persian and Macedonian ancestry, and a relief from his mausoleum depicts his Iranian ancestors, Darius and Xerxes on the left, Darius and Khashoyosha, while an inscription from Asamir on Nymphaios says that he ordered the priest to wear Persian dress on his and his father's birthdays. Here at Komagini, Verathragna, the victorious warrior god, 
or uh, as we uh, um, read about in the Vahram Yasht or Yasht 14, is merged with Aris. And there is also an ins um, the statue, a second century statue of a bronze figure from Seleucia on the Tigris in Mesopotamia, now modern Iraq, dating to the Parthian period, which also gives actually uh, you know, both names of Heracles and Verathragna and Apollotia. So we know that this was quite common in that period. An Iranian or Zoroastrian iconography, and I'm saying all because we're not very certain, uh, is also found in the art of Elimais in the region of present-day Izeh or Mala Amir in the Bakhtiari region of South Western Iran. Here, local kings who received their crown from their Parthian overlords have left behind a number of rock reliefs where symbols such as the diadem, the royal falcon, suggest the importance of the khvarna, the glory of the king received from God, and they are represented also in the presence of divine beings. At the site of Bar de Nishande, near Masjid de Soleiman, an architectural relief shows a scene with a male figure in elaborate belted tunic and trousers at the bottom, now in the National Museum of Iran, standing near a, by a fire and sacrificing over the altar. His tall tiara or kola suggests it could be the Parthian king of kings himself. This relief may be dating to AD 200. Coins from Elimais, like Parthian coins, also show a whole range of um, divine symbols, particularly um, symbols that are connected uh, with kingship. And the um, diadem plays a very important role, sometimes shown on its own, but it's often also carried in the beak of the royal falcon or the Varagna bird. And we have also representations of figures uh, with radiate crowns, which could be the Yazata Mithra. Now, the evidence presented to you suggests that the iconography of the Parthian period should also be understood within an Iranian Zoroastrian context. Just because the Arsakid Parthians adopted the Greek language of the iconography and also use Greek for their official documents does not mean that they were not Iranians or not Zoroastrians or that they were lover of the Greeks. This term is definitely uh, introduced for political reasons in order to keep the uh, Macedonian population of the in the western part of the empire uh, under control. To conclude, it is interesting that modern Zoroastrian symbols all derive from Sasanian and Achaemenid iconography. But for once, this is not because the Sasanians destroyed much of Parthian evidence, which they did, but not in this case. But this is because in the 19th century, when Zoroastrian iconographic images were chosen, Sasanian rock reliefs in the Achaemenid ruins of Persepolis, Nakhcherostam, and Bisutun were well known. But Parthian art was less visible and less well known. And if you're interested in uh, my talk and generally the sort of understanding of religious royal iconography, I would, like you to in I would like to invite you to a small exhibition that I'm curating at the British Museum. It opens on the 24th of October to the public, and it's called Wise Men from the East, Zoroastrian Traditions in Persia and Beyond. Why this title because I wanted to make it a bit jazzy. It runs over Christmas. Persia is always very appealing to the public. Iran is a bit frightening. <laughs> and um, just to show you how far I'm going, I'm actually showing this Christian reliquary, Chas, which dates to 1250 and presenting it as a Zoroastrian iconography because uh, if you look very, very carefully, the first mag magus, the first priest, 
has his hand covered in the Iranian Zoroastrian tradition. And please stop this quarrel about insiders and outsiders because I think our subject is suffering enough and this will only put us steps and steps back. Thank you. Dear colleagues, although the records of Iranian and classical antiquity abound, yeah, there, there, there's no actual labeled image of the prophet that we know before the Italian Renaissance. This isn't because, as you've seen, that we lack for visual imagery or iconography in the Zoroastrian tradition. And the recent discoveries of Sogdian and other Central Asian religious art have enriched the iconographic record. Even before that, we knew that the Armenians and Comagenians had image shrines containing images like this of the Yazatas that were influenced in style to some degree by Greco-Roman art. Uh, this is the Hierothesian, the sacred um, funerary enclosure of Nemrut Dach from the first century BC in southeastern Anatolia. There are also bas-reliefs. Uh, uh, this is at Nemrut Dach too and Arsimea on the Nymphaeus, um, where a king or ancestor is shown shaking hands with various gods, in this case Mithra, or receiving a large ring which sometimes is adorned with trailing ribbons. The statues in the round that face the fire altars of Nemrut Dach are Cyclopean in scale, but as you saw just now with yours truly, the reliefs that flank the processional ways are on a human scale. Now, it'll be seen presently that Zoroastrians have used this standard image of Mithra in particular to represent the prophet Zarathustra. So I'd like to say a few things about um, these particular symbols. The ring uh, that the god offers kings is thought to be the sun-like divine glory, Hwarna, that's bestowed on just and rightful rulers and taken away from wicked ones. It, sometimes it's envisioned as a bird or a ram and thus described in texts. Uh, and if, if indeed this ring is Hwarna, then it's a representation of realities that belong to the spiritual, the Menog world. But the ring might also, perhaps simultaneously, be viewed as an object on a mundane and visible level. That is the diadem. Uh, Middle Persian has two words for this, uh, didem or pusag. Sagdi and Afse, and the Armenian loanword Pesach. This was very much part of the Gaitig world. It was part of the coronation. Uh, so it could be a simple uh, depiction from life. The diadem was tied around the crown at the time of coronation. At the ceremony of investiture, a, an Iranian king was not fully enthroned until this act had been completed. And in the Arsacid era, a noble house held in hereditary perpetuity the office of Karanant. Uh, in Parthian Iran, it seems that the Suren clan were the Taj Baksh, the crown bestowers. In Armenia, only a Bagratuni Naharar could be the Tagadir, the Karanant. And on the reliefs, it's a divinity who hands the ring to the king, not, not a nobleman. And he does not slip it over his crowned head, he merely hands it to him. So if indeed we are, we're looking at investiture scenes, they're symbolic, uh, in which Ahura Mazda, a spirit even among spirits, as Zoroastrian texts uh, text stress, is made visible. So we deal either with a metaphor or the Menog world parallel to our own, or perhaps with a funerary image. And this is a possibility I'd like to explore in greater depth. The scenes and objects uh, that I've shown so far have a funerary connotation. The king meets and greets the divinities and is seated with them in the next world. This is reasonable. All Zoroastrians encounter Mithra, Rashnu, and Srausha after death at the time of judgment, according to the texts, and the blessed then sup with them as well. Um, Sasanian coins name the monarch as one who is chihr as yazdan. His seed is from the gods. So perhaps the kings might have uh, thought that the gods to whose number they belonged might be visible to them even while they were alive. 
In Rome, this was a device that was employed somewhat ironically to ridicule a hubristic emperor. At the full moon, in accordance with his claim to be on an equal footing with the gods, Caligula used to invite Luna, the moon goddess, to his bed. Did you not see her, he demanded once of Julius <coughs> Vitellius, who was himself later to become emperor, survive Caligula. No, replied the latter tactfully, only you gods can see one another. So perhaps these reliefs show us what otherwise we might not see. A Sasanian relief at Tachibostan near Kermanshah, to be considered presently, like a similar earlier one of Ardashir at Nakhche Rostam, is always called an investiture, and 10 out of the 28 odd Sasanian rock reliefs are. Now, the ancient Iranians were sticklers for protocol, and the scene of a god handing the ring of glory or diadem of legitimacy or whatever it was to the king might have been a symbolic representation of what was going on in the material world, or it could be funerary. The one thing we know is that it is not an accurate depiction of what actually transpired at an investiture. Um, in these scenes, the monarch greets, uh, meets the god Ahura Mazda on foot or on horseback. Ardashir's steed at Naksha Rostam tramples the fallen Ardavan, and Ormaz, a human, humanoid with gorgon locks generally taken to be Ahriman, who the Bundahishan tells us is in a basement in hell. A basement is one word, but that's still very far down. Uh, let's get there. There he is. Uh, now, this again is not something one would have seen at a court investiture. Uh, usually the deposed king was not displayed, if, if for no other reason than corpses were ritually impure. And Afriman is fortunately invisible. Uh, Armenian, incidentally, preserves an ekphrastic epithet, a word, a word crystallized in amber, as it were, from Parthian days for the particular humiliation to which these defeated enemies were subjected. Sumbagakoch, meaning trampled underfoot by the hooves of horses. So could this perhaps have been intended as much as a scene of the just king's welcome into the next world as a rite of investiture? I'd like you to consider this point. So, so far we have portrayals in Iranian art of men and gods. One of the latter, Mithra, looks much the same wherever we find him in the Iranian world, from Komagene all the way to Bactria, suggesting that the viewer was expected to recognize him without the help of an inscribed caption, such as the <coughs> multilingual one identifying Ormazd at Naksha Rostam. The Sasanians destroyed statues in the round of Yazatas, but they apparently felt no hesitation in portraying divine and supernatural beings, Ormaz, Danahita, the Dina. But Zarathustra is not portrayed anywhere. Indeed, no official inscription of any Zoroastrian dynasty ever mentions the prophet by name. The most we can surmise from this silence is that the context did not call for it since, since religious texts mention him abundantly. Though the reciter of the Fravarane identifies himself as Zarathustrish, and the prophet's name is attested in widely varying local forms that may attest to local Zans, I'll discuss this presently, the only name given to the good religion itself in inscriptions is Mazda worship. So Zarathustra brought the good religion, but he was not a divine being, nor an immortal one, although he was considered the greatest of men. But there is one ancient portrait painting, more precisely one of a pair, which in the opinion of some scholars was intended to depict Zarathustra, although again there's no inscription and the suggestion remains purely hypothetical. The fresco was found in the Mithraeum of Dura Europus and dates to the early th third century uh, AD, that is to a time shortly before the destruction of the city. Dura, was a walled fortress city on the Euphrates frontier of the Roman Empire with the Parthians and later the Sasanians. The population was heterogeneous. The Mithraeum there, uh, where this painting comes from, was dedicated, obviously, to an Iranian deity in a region steeped in Iranian Zoroastrian culture and tradition. 
So it makes sense that there was a considerably stronger Iranian flavor to the art of Dura than that which one finds in Mithraic temples, such as the one here in the city of London or uh, Hadrian's Wall. For instance, there's a fresco decoration on the arch uh, over the portraits in cult Cultonich, uh, and contemporary with the portraits that come from the third and latest repair of them and enlargement of the temple of alternating fire altars and cypresses. We do not find this elsewhere in Mithraic art, nor certainly as prominently, but the fire particularly sacred to the Parthians, that of Adur Burzin Mer, Mithra the Lofty, was enthroned in Khorasan, not far from the great cypress of Kishmar. So the repetition of these juxtaposed images seems more than mere decoration or mere coincidence at Dura. The founder of the temple was not an Iranian, but a local Syrian legionary, that is a soldier of Rome, Ethpani, the Strategos, son of Zabdei, the chief of the archers of Dura. The frescoes, however, were not painted by soldiers, but by professional artists, and the style is much the same as that which one finds in other uh, temples in the city, this, from the synagogue to Wazanathkana's uh, temple and so on. So portraits of two men in white flank the cult niche with the Tarakhtani scene. They stare straight ahead, hold slender ebony staffs, and are seated on carven chairs. Franz Cumont wrote confidently in the excavation report co-authored with Mikhail Rostovtsev. Uh, here they are. Uh, there is no doubt that the persons represented in the paintings must be regarded as magi or prophets. The uh, who are the authors or interpreters of the several books. And they accordingly identify these two with Zarathustra and with a legendary figure known abundantly in classical sources, but not at all in Zoroastrian ones, named Ostanes, who was supposed to have been a great magus of antiquity. All sorts of objections have been advanced against this identification. Um, First of all, that this, that this is the dress not of uh, Zoroastrian priests, but of Palmyrene ones. Uh, this doesn't stand up to, uh, to, to our uh, careful argument because in fact the Palmyrene priests and others in Syria modeled their uh, sacerdotal attire on that of the Iranians. Uh, there, there is no strong cultural difference between Hatra, Palmyra, Edessa, the daughter of the Parthians, as it was called, and uh, Iranized Armenia to the north and Parthian Iran immediately to the east. In fact, even the trousers worn by the Kohanim of the Temple of Jerusalem were an innovation, innovation introduced from Iran. Yeah? Moreover, and so it is suggested that, the, uh, that these depict uh, donors. Yeah? Now, they could have been in fancy dress for Lodge Night, but donors to, uh, don donors to Mithraic temples are usually named together with their epithets like Nama Renatus. Nothing said. One is supposed to know who they are. This is a portrait as close as we'll ever get to a portrait from life of a of a prominent Mobed of Sasania in Iran. This is, a, this is a painting of the visitation of the Magi from the Etchmiads in Gospel. Uh, it's it, Armenian. It was painted in the Sasanian period and sewn in with a 10th century uh, Gospel. And as you can see, the attire of this priest is almost identical to that of the uh, priest at Dura Europus. The only difference is that it's colorful, but then again, he wasn't in a temple at the time. Um, so I think that perhaps what we, what we have here is, is indeed a, a depiction intended to be that of Zarathustra. There's one other interesting uh, aspect of this, of this painting from Dura, uh, Dura, which is that not only do these figures hold um, uh, staffs, they, they also hold little scrolls. You know, where are they? Yeah, you see, you see him holding a scroll. Um, this is very interesting because in addition to being regarded as a great astrologer and so on, uh, Zarathustra was considered in antiquity to have been a nomothetes, a lawgiver. 
he had received the laws from the Agathos Daimon, or Epitichus Noema, the fortunate mind, or Vohumanach, um, in ancient texts. Um, and in the iconography of, of Dura, it's quite possible that he is holding a scroll of the laws. Yeah? Uh, it would be very unusual for a Mithraic official to be holding a scroll. The Mithraists didn't have books, and uh, they preferred to memorize their teachings. Yeah? The, then there's another problem. Why should Zarathustra be depicted with anybody else? If indeed that's him, who's the other fellow? Well, it could be uh, Ossanes, but as we've seen already, very often Zoro Zoroaster is portrayed together with someone else on either side of a fire altar. Yeah? It could be Lohrasp, it could be uh, another person, the legendary Ostanes, perhaps. Uh, and as the priest par excellence, Zarathustra could very easily be shown as the Zautar together with a Raspi. Yeah? on either side of a fire altar, or for the Mithraists on either side of the Tarakteni scene. So the paintings uh, at the temple to Mithra may or may not include a portrayal of the Iranian prophet in antiquity. Um, what, in the meantime, did contemporaries think of him? About... Um, about a, uh, two centuries after the destruction of Dura by uh, Shapur I, the, Zoro, uh, the Armenians had become Christian and went to war against the Sasanians in an effort to preserve their religion against reconversion. I don't want to go into the question of conversion here. Uh, but uh, Yerisha Vardabed mentions Zoroaster. He calls him Metzen Zradeshten, <coughs> and speaks of the Orenus Zradashtakan, Zoroastrian laws, in his eyewitness chronicle of the events. Uh, this chronicle, the history of Vartan Mamikonyan, is rich in contemporary information about Persian Zoroastrian beliefs and practices. The letters and rescripts are paraphrases, true to the style of Sasanian originals, maybe translations, and very often the vocabulary doesn't require a translation into Armenian, which shares a large body of uh, religious vocabulary with the Iranians. Several manuscripts of the 16th and 17th centuries of Yerisha's text offer interesting marginal glosses of the name of the Iranian prophet, which is given, as I said, as Radeshin or Zradasht. As, and they call him either Karev or Ucht, which means a mighty or significant covenant, or bun bank, which means fundamental words. It's impossible to tell how old these glosses are, but three of the four terms used in them are Iranian loans. Uh, ucht, covenant, literally something spoken, probably either interprets the element da, deshen as dashen, an Iranian loanword meaning covenant, or else echoes the Middle Iranian form Zardukht, uh, whose intrusive ch would suggest such an interpretation to a hearer. The first element of the word zera could have been understood as deriving from zor, power, also an Iranian loan in Armenian. So in other words, can, Armenians of the Sasanian era might have understood the name of the prophet to mean not golden light, not old camel, but fundamental words or mighty covenant. That is to say that they understood him more than anything else as the bringer of a spiritual, intellectual, and verbal message, yes? The Avesta, after all, is one entire mantra spenta. He's a mantran. The, collo the colloquies with Ahura Mazda were so central and significant that, that the mountain where they took place is called the Spento Frashna. And the Fravarane I referred to earlier bases its authority on all the questionings, all the meetings at which Zarathustra and Ahura Mazda conferred together. So as a mantran, as a lawgiver, Zarathustra could very easily be seen as somebody holding a scroll and representing a covenant. Yeah? It's just possible this Armenian gloss finds a parallel 
at the other end of the Zoroastrian world. Uh, I don't want to go into this in detail. I don't have that much time. But um, as, yeah. as we move to Tache Bostan, yeah? notice this, 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 this uh, lotus. It's rather unusual. Uh, Carter suggests that it's related to Sasanian policies in the Kushan Empire. It's indeed possible. It's certainly not Mithra's flower. The 16th chapter of the Bundahishan says rather vaguely that all flowers are associated with him, and Aban is associated specifically with the lotus. Um, but she, in her article on, on this relief, she also mentions, interestingly, that uh, when the Sasanians were engaged in their expansionist policies in the East, um, they, they encountered Zoroastrians living there who, who, called, the, um, who called the prophet um, Jarashabda. Jarashabda is not the only way we can pronounce Zarathustra's name, of course, in Indic. Uh, everybody who speaks Gujarati here knows that uh, Jardosht is the usual way one says this. Why Jarashabda? It seems a kind of forced pronunciation, but if you note that Shabda means word, yes, and that the Armenian gloss suggests that Zarathustra is identified preeminently by the power of his words and by the verbal covenant which he made with God, then perhaps we have evidence of an interesting folk etymology, local Zand. Yes? Um, in any case, what's significant for us is that this is the source of most Zoroastrian, present-day Zoroastrian portrayals of the prophet. It belongs to a complex of uh, reliefs on the cliff face uh, near Kerman Shah. Uh, there, are, there are all kinds of problems associated with its, with its dating, with who the king is. Uh, is Shapur II is not the only candidate. We know for certain that the prostrate figure is Julian the Apostate, though, whom Shapur defeated. Um, and Ahura Mazda is handing a ring, whatever it is, to, to the king. Yeah? But, but Mithra stands with a barsum as a witness to a kind of a covenant. Yeah, and this is the basis of the very familiar portrayals of Zarathustra, sometimes even with the lotus, that we know. Imago Clipiata, there, that's Naksha Rustam, uh, you've seen these earlier. Um, yeah, and There are questions that are raised here that I can't answer. Mithra is obviously the embodiment of the covenant. Yes? Uh, he is the most human of all of the Azatas and the one who is most easily identifiable of all of the Azatas, portrayed the same way wherever we find him. The variants in Parsi iconography are slight, sometimes the prophet holds a Gorzegov sar, just like a priest does before initiation, and then sleeps with it under his pillow. Sometimes he holds a staff, somewhat like that of the uh, priest from uh, Dury Europus. Sometimes he holds something that looks a bit like a torch. Um, but all of these are just variations on a theme. Did Parsis know that in portraying Zarathustra as Mithra, they were portraying the bringer of a covenant as the God who embodies the covenant, as that portraying the most godlike of men with the most manlike of gods. Yes? I don't know. Uh, what we do know, however, is that Zoroastrians in the early modern period before any encounter with Western archeological or philological research did have an image of, uh, of, sorry, of Mithra that seems very much like the standard iconographical type that was to be um, borrowed as that of the prophet Zarathustra. In the 17th century, Dastur Anushir von Marsbon of Kerman beheld in a dream 
the Yazata Mihr with a luminous face, and it's described in a Persian verse in a responsum, a rivayat, uh, which I translate here. Dastur Nushirvan told me, this is a secret hidden among the good and bad alike. One night as I was deep in slumber, I beheld one whose face was like the sun, from whom wafted the fragrance of musk and rose water. Languorous was that ambergris perfume. I opened my mouth and spoke to him, who are you? Tell me your name. He said, know that I am Mihrized, who by the gracious command of the knower of the hidden am the keeper of all covenants. I am the guide in the material and spiritual world. I shatter the works of Ahriman. I work enmity against the demons and Satan. So perhaps. Between the Mithra of Sasanian and earlier ages, whose appearance seems to have been remembered in indigenous tradition, and the appropriation in modern Zoroastrian art of that image for the portrayal of the prophet lies the entire era of the growth of the Western tradition in which Zarathustra was at first but dimly remembered. Gemistos Plethon revived the classical image of the Persian astrologer mage for the Italian Renaissance, and Raphael, oh, sorry. And Raphael, um, portrays Zarathustra in his, in his famous painting, The School of Athens, uh, where he's shown with Ptolemy and Euclid, but opinion seems to be divided about which figure actually represents him. Vasari, in his Lives of the Artists, calls him Zoroaster Re de Batriani, king, king of the Bactrians. So he may be the figure... facing away from us in a radiate royal crown, and not the figure in white holding a celestial globe, actually. Um, and if we look more closely, see the one facing away from us? He has all of these strange-looking oriental symbols, like pseudo astrangula or something, um, on the hem of his robe. Uh, an oriental sage, in other words, yes? Uh, and th this is interesting because we have a precursor to Raphael's painting there. Um, not nearly as nice, it's, it's, but then it's not the Renaissance yet, is it? It's Giusto de Padova, who painted a fresco on the right wall of the Cappella di Sant'Agostino of the Eremitani, of the philosophers of antiquity seated beneath the figures embodying their particular arts and sciences. And this is from from a manuscript copy of the fresco. And Zarathustra is seated below a figure representing dialectic. He's called Sereastes, and he's writing unintelligible characters on a page. And that seems to have been a prototype for Raphael, perhaps. Uh, at any rate, Donenfeld, who studied the fresco, describes these as undoubtedly intended for oriental script. The problem is other, other philosophers are also scribbling away in the fresco, but I think it's, quite, it's possible at least that the crowned figure in the School of Athens represents Zarathustra, and as another uh, serendipitous coincidence, and I, I can't vouch for anything more, the crown looks very much like the radiate nimbus of Mithra that we've seen before, somewhat mysterious. Uh, how much longer do I have, Professor? That's about, it. That's about it. Good. I had an appendix, which was going to dis. I'll just for say. I wanted to make a, a pitch for. For a subject I teach called Armenian. This is a. Um, this is a funerary, uh, relief here, from uh, Artsakh Nagorno Karabakh. You can tell that from the weapons of the nobleman buried, it's not that ancient, unless we have a prehistoric flintlock here. But you see the, see the prince entering the, the next world. He holds aloft this mysterious circle with ribbons trailing from it. We have another tomb which shows uh, a prince again standing on the prostrate body of defeated enemy, very much like Naksha Rustam. And he's coming into the Gerizman, that's Armenian for the grave, which is an exact rendering of Garo Demana, the house of song, and here is a Busan singing for him. Yeah? And he's going to have his drasm and basm and hope. Yeah? Um, the point is, and it's a point with which I almost close, that 
What's useful about looking at the Armenian reliefs is that they have epitaphs that identify what's going on. And this prince is receiving something called in the inscription the Antaram Pesach, the, un, the un, in, un, imperishable diadem. And it uses a loan word from Middle Iranian for diadem. In other words, it names for the first time anywhere what this thing is. We no longer have to worry about whether it's Khwarna or say it could be, it could be Khwarna, but it's a diadem. It's named as a diadem. That's very useful. And to come back to the image of Zarathustra. Well, the prophet represented to us what Mithra does too. Friendship, love, covenants, truth, light. So I think that if every good Zoroastrian, Parsi, Irani, simply looks in the mirror, he or she will see the image of Zarathustra. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for another very interesting paper. We have lots to discuss and lots to, um, to ask about. I wonder if I could exploit my position as chair to ask a question to Franz, first of all. Um, you showed us this, this silver bowl with the four, pair, four, four pairs of figures. And unless I was sleeping, you didn't tell us who the figure in the middle is. You told us it's not Anahita, but uh, who is it then? I, for this figure, I sided with Marshak's interpretation, an allegory of the earth. She clearly represents the earth. The model comes from Ceres. Uh, the, the, the griffin is composite. The question is whether she is the earth in general or Spandarmat, goddess of the earth. Um, well, the fact that she's, she's semi-nude, and I, I don't think here she can be <coughs> labeled as Spandarmat. She's the earth. Uh, and, 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 uh, um, uh, it's consistent with the Greek or Roman models where uh, we have either, uh, in one model I showed there, you have, you have Dionysus on a panther surrounded by the seasons. Seasons, yes. Um, and, um, uh, well, in one instance, uh, the wooden panel I showed from Quiruk Tobe, the, the, it seems that uh, the person seated on the griffin is really, uh, is really the goddess Pandama because she holds an ossuary. I see, yes. Uh, which is yes, what she's then. supposed to do at Fresh mm -hmm. But, well, I would, I'm not so sure, but I would say uh, in, 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 in certain cases, the person on a griffin can be the earth in general. Well, maybe I would call her, I would call her Zam. Uh, in some other instances, she might be more precise this Pandama. So that's something we still need to think about. You know, of course, in, there's uh, similar things in Christian iconography. There is a famous um, floor fresco. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the name of the site. It's in Palestine somewhere, where Jesus is in the middle, surrounded by the 12 months yes. who are labeled as January. Yes, February, yes, February, yes. Yes. So there are certainly parallels. Yes, other questions? Many, yeah, please. Uh, Antonio. Yes. One looks at right, and one, one looks toward mm. left. Uh, yes. This uh, is, the, and this has very, uh, very It's interesting. something which puzzled yeah. me, and yeah. I have no explanation. Well, it can have a very simple one. One is looking at the uh, sun. Rising. Rising. Rising, I mean rising, and mm. with the, um, uh, the duration of the daylight, and the other one, uh, the opposite phenomenon, the, in, uh, we, we have six months later. So 
it's in your uh, mm. in your line. I think so. you yeah. could use this. Uh, this yeah, it's remark. convincing. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Antonio. Yeah, others, yeah, please. from uh, Franz Gone. The, um, the ring, in the Persian dictionary produced in India, Borhan Gate, they have a name for it. It's called Yare, which means support. And it does not always uh, have, uh, is not presented by gods only. In Bishop Urtu, it's all, also in the mm -hmm. hands of um, some kings and some of the army men. Mm -hmm. um, on uh, Franz Gone, uh, the uh, Chimera in, in, in the middle of the uh, bowl that you showed had, has a uh, wheat tail like the bull in Toroctony. Uh, a wheat tail. A wheat tail. Uh, yes, the a tail. Palm, palm, a, palm, uh, a palm leaf tail. Yeah, so uh, can you explain that? Uh, I did, uh, well, I, I, uh, I followed Marshak in this respect. Uh, it shows the, it symbolizes the the, 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 the plant element, so that the, 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 um, um, uh, the beast she is, uh, she, she is sitting on could be properly in Greek called the panthera. She's the, the beast of the beast of universe. So she's, uh, she has elements from a bird, from a lion, from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, um, uh, a goat, and also uh, from the plants. So she, she embodies everything on earth. Yeah, other questions? Then I'll ask another one, James. Yes. This um, figure that you thought may or may not be Zoroaster uh, from Dura, mm -hmm. is he wearing a hat or does he have flames coming out of his head? No, he has what's often called a uh, Phrygian cat. Mm -hmm. uh, it does look rather like flames in the... In the, in no, the no. No, 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 it's a Phrygian cat. It's just a Phrygian and cat, but there's no... Interpretation, which, what, which uh, um, I once came across, mm -hmm. um, uh, identifies them as um, the high priests. Well, that would... That would be possible, yes, indeed. Uh, if they are high priests, then high, how many high priests would, it, would the Mithraists have? Why two? See, we can, we can portray Zarathustra together with someone else or a Zoroastrian priest together with someone else on either side of an altar, yeah? Uh, but there was only one pater patrum. There was only one Mithraic high priest. Uh, we don't know how he dressed. One is smaller than the other. It might indicate a hierarchy. Uh, it's possible. Uh, then again, Zarathustra is greater than Ostanes. Uh, I, I, I'm not married to any particular theory. What I wanted to, to suggest is that we should not dismiss Kuman and Rostovtsev out of hand. Mm. I think that, that, they had, uh, that, that their hypothesis was M m m far more plausible than is generally uh, accepted now. That's all, and that this could, could indeed be a portrayal of Zarathustra. But it may well not be. Uh, there, there are many problems of Mithraic art. Yeah, we also know that uh, there was a, that a Zoroastrian uh, who was of a high priestly grade could be called Zarathustra, the one most like Zoroaster. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's quite possible. I don't think, for example, that this represents somebody of the Persis grade of Mithraism. Again, why have two of them? Yeah. Now, my, my only suggestion was that, was that we have to consider, first of all, that this, this particular Mithraeum was built on the Parthian border. Yes? Uh, that when we consider the art of Dura as a whole, we're looking at a, a, an iconography for any given religious painting there which is suffused in Iranian symbolism. This is even true of the synagogue, yeah? Uh, the, the, 
the, uh, there is a painting in the synagogue of the resurrection of the dead from the book of Ezekiel. And it reproduces carefully the stages of resurrection that the Zoroastrian texts speak about at the end of time. The scene of Mordecai and Haman is, a, is an Iranian court scene. Yeah? Uh, uh, it may even be that the same firm who built the Mithraeum were engaged to paint other temples, yeah? And that they were, they, they were the people who uh, gave Rostovtsev the title for his Dura and the problem of Parthian art, Parthians. May, may I just add something? Please. I think we shouldn't forget that Dura Europus was part of the Parthian Empire for 100 years, yeah. from the time of Mithridatus II, from 100 to AD 10 or whatever. So, yeah. you know, the, the Parthian influence is absolutely there. Well, we have, we, we have Parthian graffiti in, yeah. the, in the synagogue. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. definitely. To support James' argument about the paintings at the synagogue, we have the Pahlavi graffiti. Uh, they are concentrated on two scenes, the, re the vision of Ezekiel, and the Book of Esther. And uh, according to the more recent decipherings, the graffiti say, uh, so-and-so scribe visit was shown that by the servant of the Jews and approved. Mm -hmm. So they were particular, the Sassanian officials were specifically directed by the Jews of Dura to the scenes which could have an appeal in their own culture. And this has an exact parallel in the Sasanian conquest of the Holy Land, when of the many churches that were destroyed by the Sasanians, one with a, with a depiction of the visitation of the Magi was kept. I forget which Byzantine historian says the Mobadans saw their priests and spared the picture and the building. So, yes, indeed. True, of course, yeah. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yes, please. Just very quickly, um, in your uh, uh, paper, France, uh, you said, I've noted down, you said that one reason for um, disagreeing with Marshak's interpretation, you, you said, why is no ruse at the bottom? You remember? You yeah. said, why is no ruse at the bottom? Uh, considering that it is, as you say, a silver plate, and considering you've also called it a bowl, we're really looking at it vertically, aren't we? Whereas in life, it would be looked at horizontally. And so I don't think that's a phrase that really applies in the sense that looking at a bowl, you're seeing it in the lateral round. Mm. Do you see what I mean? I, I don't see, mm. unless, you find, unless you're looking at it as a kind of clock with the hours on it or the months on it that's fixed, that turning it round, I mean, I entirely agree with your argument that it should be looked at that no, no rules should be moved around. Uh, but I can't see that looking at it vertically as having a top and a bottom is uh, helpful. Yes, but agree? in this case, anyway, they are upside down. They are not only in the, bo the bottom, they are upside down. It's not the most convenient position for the most, uh, for the holiest of festivals. Well, aren't they all upside down, depending on where you're standing? <laughs> well, is the central no, because we're looking at the picture from, the, from the central figure, yeah? The central figure so is right. She tells us up. up and down. Yeah? And in this case, no rules would be would at be the at bottom, bottom and upside yeah. down. Yeah. The less distinguished position. Yeah. <laughs> so the point of reference is the central figure, who is. Who is so. Yeah, another question? Uh, um, Mrs. Uh, Way in the back. Uh, Mrs. Sudova. Before lunch, we uh, heard about how in the Sasanian period, they tried to uh, look to the Zoroastrian religion as a sort of legitimizing um, ancestry and so on. And you've tried to show the, you know, the depiction of Zarathustra in sort of one or two instances. You haven't really explained why, given all this concern to, to identify with the Zoroastrian tradition, Zarathustra himself was not really either carved or painted uh, extensively, apart from saying that, well, he was only a man. Uh, well, the 
Sasanian reliefs depict very few holy religious scenes, mostly they're state reliefs. Uh, there, there are some exceptions. Uh, it's possible, for example, that we see the Chin, Chinvat Pool and the Daina, and, but then again, it's the king advancing with Cartier across the, across the bridge. So the portrayal even of the afterlife, an explicit portrayal, with, with, with the bridge of the separator and so on, still has a political message. Um, the inscriptions of the Sasanian kings speak about the Zoroastrian religion, but the Zoroastrian religion was called at the time Daini Mazdasin, which means the religion of Mazda worship. The, re the reason for this is that that's the focus of the religion. Zarathustra was a human being. One doesn't worship him, one worships God. Uh, it was commonplace until not very long ago to refer to a certain religion now practiced very widely in Iran is Mohammedanism. Uh, and uh, as you're aware, no doubt, this was a misnomer. Yeah, based upon Christianity. When Muhammad died, there, according to tradition, I think it was his uncle who said, for those of you who worship Muhammad, Muhammad is dead. For those of you who worship God, God is the living and the eternal. Yes? Omar. So, so, sorry? Not, not his uncle, Omar. Oh, was it Omar? Yeah. yeah. I'm not too, too up on that particular faith, <laughs> but... Um, yeah, I, th I think you get my point. A Zoroastrian is Zarathustri, but the, the name Zoroastrian that you use nowadays should not obscure entirely the fact that it, it, it's not Zarathustra whom Zoroastrians worship. Zarathustra was a human being who was privileged in the sense that he, that he got to see and speak to Ahura Mazda and to bring a clear and articulate revelation and that one is enjoined to emulate him, but not to worship him. Uh, I have a question to James about Please. the Raffaello painting. Yes. Uh, I, uh, I side with the identification of Zoroaster as uh, the one who holds the Armillor Sphera, mm -hmm. and his features are actually those of Cardinal Bembo, mm -hmm. who had... Um, who had um, uh, an amitié amoureuse with Lucrecia, Lucrecia Borgia <laughs> and uh, finished as a cardinal. He was a friend of Raffaello. Mm -hmm. the, the one uh, who is sometimes considered yes. as Zoroaster and whom you considered as Zoroaster should, res, he, should rather be Ptolemy. Mm -hmm. He holds not the Armillor Sphera, but uh, the, the, a the celestial globe. The, no, 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 the earthly globe. globe. The globe. Earthly globe. Why yes. does he have a crown? At the time of the Renaissance, Ptolemy, the astronomer, was, was often mm -hmm. confused with the Ptolemies, the, the Ptolemy kings. Mm -hmm. It's all true, except that Vasari didn't think so. I mean, maybe Vasari was wrong. Uh, is it Vasari who says that, that uh, Zoroaster is portrayed? King of the Bactrians, yes. and thus with a crown. That's what Vasari says. Um, we, we, do, we don't really know. I thought until fairly recently that it was the figure in white who was holding a celestial mm. globe. Uh, but uh, Ptolemy has various functions, in fact. So uh, I, it, uh, maybe Vasari himself was confused. I don't, I don't really know. But, but it seems to be the common opinion at the moment, and this could shift again, yes, that... Uh, it's the figure who's facing away frustratingly from us. This is what this is. Don, this was Donenfeld's opinion in his in study. In this case, who would be the bearded man with the celestial sphere? That would be Ptolemy. That would be Ptolemy. That's his. That's Donenfeld's ah. suggestion. Yeah, yeah. Again, 
I wasn't there and I don't know. Um, no, what I would, well, the only thing I meant to suggest actually in this paper is that there are a number of frustrating possibilities uh, rather than certainties. Uh, we, we, have the, we, ha we have a portrayal of, of, uh, of Zarathustra based on that of Mithra. I don't know why. They're, I suggested that they're very similar in their ways, that they seem to converge asymptotically, as it were, yes? Uh, one is the god like a man, the other is a man like a god, and that such a, uh, su such a resemblance suggests itself, but we, we don't actually know. Again, with Dura, um, Somebody this morning mentioned that uh, it, it's useful to bring up the suggestions of the ancients, of the earlier people in our field who, who, who made suggestions which we either repeat or reject. And I, I thought that Kuman and Rostovtsev deserved a fair hearing once more. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's the end of the time for this very interesting session. I'd like to thank the three speakers.